The Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford recently hosted a lecture exploring how to approach possible LGBTQIA relationships and themes in the works of artists who did not self-identify. The discussion was prompted by new research about Stowe's great niece, Catherine Seymour Day, and how her identity may have shaped her role as a women's activist. I spoke with Amy Huffnagel, the Director of Programming at the Stowe Center, to learn more about how museums are handling the complex ethics surrounding untold queer histories and interpreting the sexuality of women in the early 20th century. The Stowe Center interprets Harriet Beecher Stowe life, um, author and abolitionist, and her great niece is Catherine Seymour Day. And so related to the Beecher family um, and was really the driving force that preserved all of that Nook Farm block of Hartford. So she both bought Harriet Beecher Stowe's house back, and then she bought and um, worked on preserving Mark Twain's house, um, the carriage houses, and the corner property, which is now called the Catherine Seymour Day, that is the Chamberlain property, property originally. And so right now, CT Humanities has funded a project around Catherine Seymour Day um, and her identity with the context of gender and female sexuality. So with this new research being done, what insights have so far emerged around Catherine? She's a complex woman, and um, a lot of her collections and letters are saved. She never married. She had many long, um, you know, friendships that went on for years and were quite intimate. And there were a number of things in the archive that made us wonder about her sexuality and her identity. It's complicated to do history like this well, and we didn't just want to um, surmise or guess on this, right? Um, and if she certainly didn't choose to be out in her own life, then what's our responsibility as an organization to out her um, now? And so we started asking ourselves a lot of really complicated questions about who could we turn to to do really good and responsible and ethical history um, that would be a positive impact on the LGBTQ plus communities rather than, um, you know, something that was sort of just a we don't know kind of answer. And so what we're what we're um, presenting on Thursday at noontime as a free lecture and lunch um, event um, on, only virtual, is a, a sort of set of possible answers to those questions we are asking about Catherine Seymour Day. And then we also invited a number of other organizations in New England who are doing comparable history to come in and sort of um, buttress and expand our conversation outside of the Stowe Center. Such an interesting point to, to bring upon this about if she wasn't outing herself in that time, who are we to out her now? And it's, it's challenging because the historians researching this are inevitably viewing this through a 21st century lens. And so can you elaborate a little bit more on how challenging it is to interpret relationships as being LGBTQ plus when you aren't even sure, did that individual identify as such? Like, what are the some of the ethics around this that you're finding? You know, I think you really can't put our um, 21st century lens on the um, Catherine's life because uh, the way she uses language, for instance, in communicating with a friend is completely different than you or I might use with a language. It's much, uh, with a friend, it's much more um, affectionate, it's more elaborate and full of like, like overt, um, care for, you know, these are all things we would uh, align with a more intimate relationship today. Yeah. Whereas at the time in the 19th century and turn of the 20th century, it was really just a sign of like beautiful friendship, right? So that's right. kind of one example. We turn to a scholar, Susan Farentinos, who is um, an expert in this topic. And she came to the Stowe Center from doing research um, around uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt is another sort of beautiful member of our historic women's history community whose identity and her relationships are somewhat 
confounding to historians, right? Um, and so anyway, Susan's really an expert in this field and this is what she does. And what's beautiful about what she does is she brings like all of the gigantic historical information. This is her expertise. And she layers all of the other things that we know um, onto the individual. So you're not just looking at the individual's letters per se, but you're looking at the individual's letters in the context of this massive archive. And that's important to kind of have all this context, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And in fact, um, so many organizations were sort of struggling with these issues of how to do this ethical and responsible history telling that she actually authored a book called Interpreting LGBTQ History at Museums and Historic Sites. And it's kind of like this really important text that organizations go to if they're thinking about doing this kind of work. It's such a complex situation as we've been talking about. And so, yeah, I was wondering about some of those guidelines that are suggested for um, museums and institutions such as the Stowe Center um, to allow them to tell these stories that may have been hidden or erased or people were afraid to come through. So what are some of those guidelines that you can follow going forward? I think reading the book is the is a central um, because there are lots of different uh, ways to sort of unpack this issue. But here's the sort of basic thing: you just can't um, read between the lines, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right? You have to have direct written or um, documented evidence of the the nature of the relationship. And, you know, just surmising that it could be is just not good history. So I think the main point for audiences to hear today is, you know, speculation is out. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You just it's can't as assume. simple as that. Yeah. yeah. And so with this new insight around Catherine and her sexuality, possibly, how could that have influenced her work as an activist um, and a promoter of women's rights? I just think she was an amazing forward thinking woman in general, and she was choosing um, uh, to do really good, important cultural work at a time when women and work was a complicated issue and in and of itself, um, not straightforward, right? Women didn't have the right to vote. They were expected to marry. They were expected to all property moved from male to male. You know, there were a lot of things that she was pushing up against besides the potential sexuality question. And so what we love about interpreting Catherine Seymour Day is all of the ways in which she was um, uh, pushing outside the boundaries of normative uh, behavior for a woman. You know, she went to Europe and studied painting and she was a really amazing painter. And so she was also engaged not just in history, but in the arts. And, um, and she really loved this idea of um, the creative endeavor, which of course comes from Harriet too, who also felt like she should use her creative endeavor to make the world a better place. And so that had to be part of the, the lineage that she absorbed from her great aunt, right? And then the lineage that we absorb today at the Stowe Center, which is that we're still trying to tell history and do good cultural work to make the world a better place and to um, encourage social justice and positive reform in our country. And to that note, um, tell us more why it's so important for the Stowe Center to present lectures such as this one. I mean, there's the Stowe Center's mission, right, which is to interpret Harriet Beecher Stowe's work and collection and to have vibrant discussions about really complicated topics, which at the time of her life was race history and enslavement and really terrible issues of injustice. Um, to my mind, the way I describe the work that we do today is that we are an organization that tells the truth. Mm -hmm. And again, sort of back to like distilling things to an essence, it's kind of not more complicated than that. Although if you look at the cultural conditions of the moment when we're doing this work, it's pretty complicated to tell the truth about history, right? It's not unpolitical um, or unculturally significant. So the Stowe Center is motivated by this really simple tenant, which is to tell the truth about the history of our country and our nation, of our city, of people's lives. 